What's up, everybody? This week on the Dragzine Podcast, we have live from Indiana, kind of taped. You'll see. It's Haley James. What's up, Haley? Oh, you know, not much. Just got home from work. How about you? Hey, you know, but it's funny that working in this industry from home, my office and my room are exactly 25 steps apart. So it's a brutal commute. Got to worry about stepping on the cat. It's terrible. You don't even have to wear pants. No, I do not. And that's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> makes life easy that's no, why we no, used to, no. yeah yeah you know it, it's funny it's like newscasters you don't know what's going on chest down Mm-mm. it's a good life yes but on the flip side though when i do have to travel to events i do have to dress for the weather and dress appropriately because safety reasons and you know just because no one needs to see that business right yeah everyone has to wear pants at the racetrack <laughs> if, if you're some, smart some sort. yeah 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 you know i always it, it's age weight weather appropriate those are the three things you need to dress by agreed especially at a racetrack because you're exposed to all kinds of crazy conditions and it's funny this year like all these races i've gone to so far have been in florida they're supposed to be warm weather races and there's at least once where i've been calling i mean you were braided to the there's a couple days there was kind of rough yeah you know i kind of appreciated it because usually when i'm in florida my shins are sweating So I kind of appreciated having to wear a sweatshirt in Florida, but I was kind of miserable there at a couple points. (laughs) On the flip side, though, when I left Ohio, it was like four degrees and snowing. So, you know, people are freaking Mm -hmm. out. Oh, it's 60 down here. I'm like, I had to scrape my car to drive here. Yeah, no, living in Florida ruins your ability to be warm and 60 degree weather <laughs> it, yeah it it, it it generally like that that southern living just changes everything and especially on the racing side of things because a lot of times they're all racing at night or like they take a few months off the year yeah and they're off seasons in the summer because it's so hot it's, it's like over in dubai where they race all at night over in the middle east because you know it's 50 million degrees during the day yeah Oof. Yeah. Yeah. No, no thanks. That's I, I, I honestly, when I'm at the track personally, I would rather be have the ability to be a little bit on the warmer side though, than the cold, because there's nothing worse than being cold at the racetrack because there's no place to be comfortable. Yeah, no, not at all. Not in the race car, not in the trailer. You can go sit in your rental car, but then everyone looks at you funny. <laughs> you and then you got to go back outside at some point. So yeah. you just got to yeah. get used to it. You know, it, it, it's already been a, a busy year for you guys because it seems like you, uh, you've you literally just hit the ground running at any chance there's been a race you guys have been at it so far. Yeah, pretty much. You know, we probably won't get to do that all year, uh, unfortunately. It's the reality of life. But, yeah, um, we went to U.S. Street Nationals, and then we went to Lights Out, and then NMRA Bradenton. And it's kind of nice because all of it was in the same area. Uh, um, the car's still in Florida right now in the truck and trailer. And then the next event that it'll be at is Outlaw Streetcar in Virginia. So we'll just drive up from there and then it'll go back to Indy. And we'll see from there. Got to do the whole uh, logistics planning and whatnot. You know, if you're, if you're yeah. going to do a lot of these, I think that's one thing a lot of casual fans might not realize on the racing side of things, the amount of logistics that goes into this, if you're going to travel to a lot of big events. Yeah, no, for sure. And you got to pick which ones and how it works into where you're driving because you have to have somewhere to keep the truck and trailer or it's getting driven a lot of miles. And before I moved to Indy, when I first met Kiefer, my boyfriend, um, you know, him, his family, Jeff Rudolph and Kelly, they allow us to keep the car in their race shop for a good majority of the year, which kind of changed a lot for you know the races we could choose to go to because that's a whole lot quicker of a drive than driving all the way from Albuquerque um so we really appreciate them doing that because that's given us opportunity to go to Florida like more than we normally would or like the Michigan race or stuff like that and stuff we wouldn't normally make the drive for necessarily yeah that's a haul coming from out west I mean that's Part of it, though, is fun at the same time, because a lot of your adventures happen on the road to get the race. Because I like I always tell people stories about stuff I see on the road and they look at me like, are you serious? I'm like, go talk to other racers that travel and ask them about some of the crazy stuff they've seen. What's some of the stuff you've seen on the road where you're like, well, that's Um, 
there's scary things and funny things. The scariest thing was probably, it's always in Atlanta or somewhere ridiculous like that. Um, where there's just traffic and people everywhere and they're driving crazy and there's no, there's, there's no organization of traffic whatsoever. People are flying by you in every lane. I see this white little like Tacoma come past me in the left lane. I'm driving just the truck and trailer going through Atlanta and he comes over and tries to cut someone else off, but loses it and starts fishtailing and literally spins in front of me. In, on the highway and I'm like trying to figure out where I need to dodge to not plow this guy and somehow miraculously just comes to a halt into where the exit ramp opens up oh. I, I no wreck happened nothing I was like that was the craziest and scariest thing I've ever seen in my life how did that guy just not get killed or kill some other people and me <laughs> and it sucks when you're driving a truck and trailer because at that point you know nope Mm-mm. Yeah, you just, no, you pick pick your route and you're, that's where you're going. Where am I going to do the least amount of damage to myself and others? Yeah, it's that's the only thing that really comes to mind. But I've seen, I mean, chairs in the middle of the road, ladders. I've seen someone's uh, like zero turn mower panel fly off and smoke a BMW right behind it. <laughs> <laughs> so those are some funny, funny ones. We, we we were driving, actually, we were driving the old speed radio video rig from the World Cup all the way to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And we I, I'll never forget this. We were driving through Tennessee, and there is a Toyota Tercel flat towing a Ford Ranger on the freeway, trying to do freeway speeds. Wow. Yeah, I'm like, wow. there. I'm like, there is so much bad that could happen from this situation. We need to get away yeah. from it right now. Yeah, things about to explode. <laughs> yeah, and like I said, it's the stuff you see on the road that makes those longer road trips somewhat bearable. You know, when you're just driving along and. Yeah. Well, I'm, like, I always joke that I, like the first year and a half of me and Kiefer's relationship was built in the truck because ninety percent of the time we got to see each other because it was long distance. We'd be driving. You know, he'd fly to Albuquerque, we'd go to Pennsylvania and then back to Albuquerque and then he'd fly home. That's like, you know, you're spending 100% of your time together. So I, I like the driving part. I like the road trip part. You kind of have no choice if you're going to choose to drag race and you grow up in New Mexico. I mean, it takes five hours to get you out of the damn place. So <laughs> if you're going anywhere other than Texas or Arizona or Colorado or something like that, which... I mean, there is none of my style racing there other than Vegas in November, really. So true or false, where we got to go. True or false, backing a trailer up is one of the best ways to test the strength of a relationship. Hmm. I would say a person like me and a person like Kiefer, 100%. (laughs) Because if you can't back the trailer up, you lose a few respect points. Not only not only respect, just the communication and whatnot part, because I have, I have seen some married couples and some significant others together, divulge into near fist fights over the maneuvering (laughs) of trailers. Like, oh, that's funny. No, we don't. Yeah, we don't do that. But I agree with you. I've seen some some real heated discussions over what direction the trailer should be going yeah turn around and walk away don't want to be a witness figure it out you have mirrors goodbye now when did you know that drag racing needed to be a major part of your life because it's about a journey for all of us and there just there comes a point where you know you see kids that say you know what uh dad does this i don't want to do it and then there's the rest of us that are like all right i'm hooked what do i do how do i keep doing this that's a really good question. Um, it's, it's always been a really big part of my life, which I think is true for most people that decide to make it a really big part of their life in the future. Um, I grew up, you know, going to the racetrack with my dad and watching him race and, you know, everybody else that I grew up at the track with quickly understanding that like going to the racetrack is equivalent to like having an extended family but at a young age you kind of don't have that consciousness of the whole you just know you're having fun 
um, it wasn't so much about drag racing back then as it was going to the drag strip and like being with the people I was with, like, you know, my dad's business partner, John Uris, back then, Brandon Reed, um, just the original B team. It, it was so much fun, you know, there's drinking and people just having a great time just partying, you know how it is at the racetrack. And as a kid, you're like, oh my God, I'm so lucky I get to be here right now because other kids don't get to do this. And that's how you grow to love it, I think, as a kid. And then obviously the cars are badass, but that's a given. And then, you know, I grew up in it and uh, my dad got me a junior when I was like nine or 10. And in Albuquerque, you know, you could take it to the drag strip on a test and tune, go test your junior. At the time, I'll be honest, when I was nine or 10, I was more into trying to get away with wearing like heels to school in fifth grade and <laughs> like wearing like dark lipstick and getting yelled at by my teachers. Like I was a rebel in a different way at that age. Um, so I didn't really appreciate the opportunity that was being presented to me. But the few times that I did test the junior, my dad saw in me that I, I could drive. You know, he's been letting me drive since I was two years old like the gators and the golf carts and stuff at, at his soccer fields. Um, so it always was just like that. So it was always a part of my life. And then what really challenged it being a part of my life when I kind of started to have to consciously make drag racing a decision uh, and understand how important it really is to me is um, well, when I was 17, that's when I started racing. Um, and then in 20. 18 or not 2018 20 2016 is when I turned 18 and I got and I was married I got married I was married for eight months to someone I wasn't meant to be with somebody not uh, affiliated with drag racing somebody that doesn't understand drag racing what it takes you know honestly you have to understand what drag racing is if you're going to be with someone that likes drag racing or just accept that that they have their thing and you have your thing. Otherwise it just won't work because to people that don't get it, drag racing, stupid, you spend too much money. You never make any money. You're just out getting drunk, partying with your friends, like putting yourself in danger. Like, you know, the, the rational person that doesn't drag race is perspective on it. Um, but it just, you know, it didn't work. And every time I'd go racing, you know, there, there was an issue with it but I didn't care going to the racetrack was like my place, my home. And so, having to consciously be like, okay, this drag racing is clearly the most important thing in my life because I will pick everything or I will pick drag racing over everything. Um, always have, but never realized why. And then that relationship ended and I was just really focused on drag racing, you know, working for my dad, helping him build engines, learning that, um, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Now realizing that it wasn't going to be business school or political science or nursing. I tried to be normal, so to speak. You see everybody in drag racing pay for their cars with a business that isn't affiliated with drag racing. So you kind of get the idea. I have to do something else to be able to pay for this because this is just a hobby. But the ones who have really figured it out are the ones that create their life in drag racing. I mean, like you, like everybody that is just wants to be at the racetrack. So they figure out, I have to make my career in the racing world. Otherwise, good luck. So I knew that I had to pick a career in drag racing. I knew it wasn't going to be, you know, business school or political science or nursing, all the things I had tried before. And one day um, I was sitting, standing in the shop with my dad building engines with him and I looked into the corner of the room at the welder that's always been in there and for whatever reason I just was looking at it differently and I had some epiphany about like well maybe I should try welding that's something I think I could do I like tedious things I like I'm the one that likes to cut the rings for the engines no one likes to do that I really like to do that so I'm like, that's welding type of thing where everything's really small and annoying. And I like that. So I went to welding school, graduated that. And uh, right after I graduated, 
moved to Indy with Kiefer and, you know, I couldn't find a job for uh, like six months because I, I, I wasn't, I mean, I was door dashing. I, I like, I, I was making money, but I didn't find like a, a job because it's so hard to find somebody that understands that like, while I'm there, I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to do everything you ask me to do, but then I have to leave for a week to go drag racing. And when I come back, I'm going to work really hard again and I'll work overtime if you want me to. Like, it's just, it's hard to find somebody that gets that. And even in Indy, you would think, you know, the heart of racing in general, you would think that this place is filled with people that understand that. And it probably is. It's just hard to find, especially during COVID year when no one's hiring or no one's looking for jobs anyways. But that's when I knew drag racing needed to be a big part of my life is um, honestly going to college and realizing that nothing I was doing was realistic at all. About halfway through each time, <laughs> I just realized, you know, uh, if I do this, I can't be who I am like right now. Even if that's not driving a car, I am the person that wants to be at the racetrack, whatever that means. Um, and I just, it made me realize I got to pick something else. And then when I met Kiefer, he went to school for graphic design and marketing and PR, and he used that for drag racing. And, you know, I, I, I know about all these people at this point that have somehow magically made their career in this industry, but I was so like lost at how I would do that. And when I met him and he was like, just, you know, works from his computer and has all these clients and drag racing. And I was like, wow, like it really is possible. Like you just have to do it. And so that kind of was inspiring as well. And yeah, I mean, here we are. That's all I want to do. I want to eat, sleep, breathe, bleed. <laughs> if I already said that, bleed twice, drag racing. I think that the way you just talked about describes, yeah, I, I totally get that because it's it, to be in this industry, you have to want to be here. You have to put in a lot of people don't realize the time and effort that if you are not blessed with piles of money, you have to work very very hard to make a living at this and it's a it's a living of passion if you will 100 percent. and you know i come from the silver spoon so to speak i get to race with daddy's money and like i appreciate that there's you know people that don't people that do whatever you get you get the haters really like, mm, daddy's money whatever like that's fine it's it is what it is you can't talk about it if i'm the one admitting it it is all my dad's money, <laughs> like, you know, and if you don't have access to someone's money, whether it's yours or someone sponsoring you, whatever, you ain't drag racing. You better be, you better have money or be, or have access to money to be able to drag race. And that's just facts. Heads up. Anyhow, you get into the bracket racing world, you can build something cheaper and have incredible driver skill and go out and win thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, and I think that's just like where there's like two different worlds uh, with that, just because where my passion for drag racing lies and my dad's and Kiefer's really has nothing to do with money, which is probably why we get, why us in general as drag racers get called stupid because it's not about the money. You're no, spending more than you'll ever make. And like, people don't get that, but it truly is a sport of passion because you spend everything you have in, in time, money, tears, blood, and sweat just for a few seconds, literally. Drag racers are the biggest idiots on earth because we spend all of our money to spend less time in our vehicle. That mm -hmm. like, that you, you explain that to like a normal person and they look at you like you have two heads. They're like, wait, you don't want to like, you could see them trying to rewind it in their mind. They're like, that, that doesn't compute. It, and it doesn't. That's why if you're going to do this for life, like you 
have to surround yourself with people that get it. Otherwise, it'll just never work. Well, you mentioned that, you know, your father's played a big role in all this, and he's been there throughout your career. And it's been interesting for me to kind of, I started thinking about this to kind of watch how it's evolved and how it continues to change. And you've gone from being, it seems like more than just, you know, the person lets go of the button and mashes a loud pedal where you're up in that car's guts a lot. You're on the laptop. You're making a lot of calls. Talk about how that's kind of like evolved between you two over the years. I mean, yeah. So it, it, obviously my dad's my dad. So he's kind of helped shape me into the person I am. And, you know, as a kid and a teenager, even though we've always been friends, so to speak, like he was hard on me, you know, you do something wrong, you get told about it just because they're trying to make you better, even though it seems harsh when you're an angsty 12 year old and, you know, why is dad being mean? <laughs> like he's not, he's trying to make you better. And, you know, I've always, I've always been a very interesting individual. Like I said, when I was 10 years old, I was trying to wear heels to fifth grade. Like it's just, I've been a handful my whole life. So trying to refocus all of that energy into like something that mattered was like my parents probably biggest uh, feat because I hated all sports. I hated all instruments. I didn't want to do anything ever except go to drag racing with my dad. But because because of life, you know, my dad wasn't racing like as much as we are now. When I was a kid, he was racing way less. So it wasn't like one of those things where I just, that's my hobby as a kid. I didn't grow up next to a drag strip or even a couple hours from a drag strip that had anything going on that we would be competing at or whatever. So I was just always disinterest, disinterested in everything and would just want to hang out with my friends or whatever. And then, like I said, he bought me a junior and I wasn't super interested at the time. And I think he kind of just not gave up on it, but it's just like, whatever, if she'll figure it out someday, I just got to let her do her thing. And if she ends up drag racing, she ends up drag racing. But I always loved driving things no matter what dad's truck. Like once I got my permit, I drove every day, everywhere, drove everyone. That was just, I've always loved driving, but then I turned 17 and uh, was about to graduate high school. And my dad told me, you know, if you stay focused and you know, you don't start screwing off, basically uh, I have something really cool planned for you, which like, if you know my dad, you don't take that lightly. Cool to, it's not like, you know, you guys go get ice cream. Like it's, it's like something cool. So I was like, okay. So December starts to roll around and dad tells me or asks me, you know, you want to drive a race car? And I was like, yeah, of course. And he was like, okay. Um, well, cause then how it came to be was Frank Varela, my teammate, he had uh, the, the blue car, the one that he won championships and renegade in. That car was his old race car. Um, it was actually his brother's race car from years and years ago that he ran in, I don't even remember like what series it was. And in the beginning of Coyote Modified in an MRA, uh, there were certain things, certain rules about how the car had to be stock in order to compete in that class basically and Frank's current car didn't fit the rules so basically him and my dad found the Fox body that I ended up driving and put it together in like two two or three months I, some ridiculous amount of time from zero to nothing and Frank won the Coyote Modified 2014 championship with it and then they changed the rules where his car would fit but he decided to move up to Renegade anyway so we basically had this Fox body, this mid eight second Fox body that had no driver. Um, and, you know, my dad could have driven it, but every time I ask him why he doesn't or doesn't still drive or didn't want to drive, he, he's more worried about the future of this sport now, where he feels like more purpose mentoring me to be 
you know, carry on his legacy, so to speak. So um, I went to Frank Holly's drag racing school. That was the surprise. And my first pass ever in the Fox body was in Amari Bradenton Q1. <laughs> and I mean, I did good. We runnered up. But nothing that, like getting th just... thrown directly into the fire. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I won't, I, that made me sound way too cool. I, for months prior to that, I had a disconnected steering wheel with two buttons on it. And I'd watch videos on YouTube of Frank staging the car and I would practice like muscle memory, bumping in, hit, you know, brake, trans brake, gas, bump, let go of the brake, let go of the trans brake, shift, shift. Like I would just go, I still do it like at least twice every single time before I go down the track because it's a routine and it is comforting when you're nervous and there's pressure to have something exactly the, the same all the time. Uh, and so I practiced a, a ton, a ton, a ton like that. So by the time I got into the car, I already had it, even though I had never done it. And I knew there, there were a lot of people watching, you know, Dwayne's putting his 17 year old daughter in an eight second car. There was a lot of people that called him stupid for that. And a lot of people that were watching going, that's pretty damn cool. And at the end of the day, that's life. <laughs> you know, it, to kind of flash forward a little bit from that, you know, you, you've went on to, to stack up a lot of trophies and some championships and it, I always like to ask the racers that have done that because not everybody can win a race, let alone an entire series, because that's, I, I've been fortunate enough to be a part of a team that won a series championship. It's not easy. What was that like for you guys and your team to do that? Because it, it's kind of magical when you can do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, you have to understand, like, uh, to, to answer that question, you have to understand what you do. I'm just saying you in general, that championship drag racing versus shootout racing, so to speak, is like, I have notes on this, hear me flip my paper, uh, is completely different. Um, you know, the things that are similar about it are that, you know, you have to be fast, you have to be consistent. And you have to have luck. Like there's just no, there's no way around. You have to have some luck. Um, but the difference is you're racing at so many different venues throughout a season that you have to have a really good ability to adapt to, you know, chassis changes, tuning, weather conditions, et cetera. Um, and basically having a really, really solid team around you, somebody, at, you know, at least somebody that understands exactly what needs to get done, how to not kill you. Um, people that just get it, uh, people that are willing to help, people that have the same aspirations and goals. Like, it's very, very important. You know, the partnerships, the sponsorships, the friends we have, the piles of parts that you have to have to win a championship. I mean, you have to make the best out of a really bad weekend. Sometimes that makes all the difference in the end. There's been mm, <laughs> countless nights that we've gotten two hours of sleep because we stayed up all night swapping something that was broken or whatever. And I mean, everyone has those stories, but even if you don't win anything the next day, being able to pull up to the starting line the next day is the best feeling in the world. And if you can't appreciate like those small wins because you're really not going to win a whole lot statistically you're just not no matter how cool or how fast or how rich or how whatever you are you're not going to win all the time like that's why drag racing is cool because there is luck involved the cars break and do things that they want to do because they all have their own little personalities and to win a championship means that you just never give up you know you fight that that you fight against that that wave for a whole season and um for us if we plan on making a championship run the whole season prior is basically looked at as like a huge test session every run is a test hit we're trying something every hit and if it doesn't work it doesn't work but we're going to try it 
And then by the end of that season, if we figure something out, if we got it right, if we're right there, then we go on for a championship. Before we get on to our next question, I have to do my uh, hit up our sponsor of this broadcast. It's uh, Airflow Research, AFR, the original CNC ported cylinder head. From the street enthusiast to the hardcore racer, AFR has designed a cylinder head for your application with one goal in mind, just to go fast, which is the point of heads up racing. And we all kind of, I, I was raised around bracket race. My dad bracket race, his friends bracket race. I personally didn't get involved in into a lot of heads up race until I started crewing for a heads up racer. I like them both. Some people don't with all these different types of racing out there. What draws you to small tire heads up racing? That's, that's one of my favorite questions. I had to spend a lot of time thinking about that one. Um, so it kind of starts off like 20 years ago, obviously all of this at the end of the day starts with my dad, but it's kind of a funny story. My dad was sitting on the toilet watching or uh, reading because you weren't watching anything on the toilet back then, reading um, Muscle Mustangs and fast forwards. And there was a little blurb talking about uh, Super Street Outlaw or Outlaw 10, one of the two, Super Street Outlaw. And uh, the quote was, asking him why he was leaving the class or, or something of that nature. And he, re he replied uh, that beer, beer drinkers and hell raisers are the only, run, only ones that run Super Street Outlaw. And my dad read that. And he was like, I'm building a class or a car for that class. And so literally that year, he turned his GT Street Mustang into a Super Street Outlaw car. And then heard the doc on the mic, Jamie Meyer, and uh, bought uh, Mike Duffy, 95 Cobra. And the rest was history from there. there. He basically told me, you know, there's a lot of legends back then and he couldn't help but gravitate towards it. And there's only one way to learn, which is something he's told me my whole life. You either, you figure out if you swim or drown or real quick, if you just throw yourself into the fire. And I love that mentality, it's living outside of your comfort zone type deal. Um, so, and then that kind of just evolved into years and years of small tire drag racing. He did Outlaw 10.5, but that's still a small, slick tire. And then I started racing and uh, Coyote Modified, which was small radial and loved it. I've actually never driven on a slick tire, which I'd love to, but I just haven't gotten the chance yet. Uh, we saw that in like ultra and renegade and extreme street, how many amazing racers and cars and how, how many there were is the, is there are, is the amazing part and how many fast ones and the quality of people, um, in those classes, is just awesome. And we figured it'd be a really great place to try to climb that mountain to try to and achieve something in a sea of greatness is where you really figure out how great you are. Speaking of sea of greatness, I, I've got to ask you about this. We got to tell the story about the world cup and, okay. and, and the burn down, because I was yeah. there working the speed video show mm -hmm. and we were like talking about different classes and me and the producer, Tom Bolts, you know, like he's a drag racing fan too. We were going through it. I was like, man, Haley, this dude, the civic, this is like, if you were like watching brackets, I'm like, this is going to be the race. This is the race everybody is here to see because there, there's been a lot of smack talk, a lot going on. You got a couple of type A personalities here. I was like, I don't know this dude in the Civic, but I know Haley is going to show up and she's not going to show this guy any mercy. And then yeah. the race comes up and like, we're just sitting in the trailer we're like, oh, this is going to be awesome. Why isn't anybody staging? And Jason Miller then both DQs you. But the, the backstory around that was, you know, we were way past curfew. There was a lot of stuff that happened at that point. And, you know, you, you mentioned you're routine based. What mm -hmm. was going through your mind as you're sitting there? Like, just did you just want okay. to bump well, it or like just screw it? So the rule is because I'm a turbo car, 
if you're not a turbo car and I, in eliminations, there's a real slim chance I'm going in first. And that's not because I just, I'm stubborn and I, I'm, I want to be cool. And like, I don't go in first. It's, it's not like an ego thing. It's, I'm a turbo car. I, I have to spool up. And once I'm up there, I'm up there. So if I bump into stage and then you either un, unknowingly or on purpose, wait your full seven seconds to get in, I'm, I'm smoking hot. <laughs> so that's, and obviously, you know, we know as drag racers that burning somebody down is like a dirty game that some people play. And until you know exactly who those people are, you just have to be very careful. So the, my dad's rule for me has always been, you don't go in first. So I don't. <laughs> and right before that round, I went up to Steve-O and I, and I don't know him. I didn't know him and he, we're cool. Like there was actually never any beef there. Um, I went up to him. I said, I have never staged against a car like yours. Tell me how you stage. So, you know, we can race correctly and he was like oh, when I see you you know we we learned later it was a miscommunication I suppose is what we came to the conclusion to but basically he said when I see you pre-stage I'll start spooling that's ba that's what I heard and I was like perfect because that's what I was planning on doing since you're also a turbo so we go in to pre-stage and I don't hear him I kind of like hoss the throttle a little bit to see if like he'll start coming up so I can come up and we go in at the same time and it's not happening. So I was like, all right, I'll just sit here because that's the game you play at that point. And it was 36 seconds in and we both got double D, which, you know, there's plenty of opinions about that. There's no hard feelings there either, but it was just one of those things. And honestly, as the kids say, that gave us a lot of clout. <laughs> As the kids say. <laughs> As the kids say. I don't fall in that generation. So that's as the kids say. But like that, that good or bad, there's no no press is bad press, apparently, because a lot of people found our names out through that. And we came back next year and won all the money. <laughs> that, 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 that that's what I was gonna get to. That's the best part, is because you know. The internet's the internet, things happen. And then, you know, you guys just tell your stuff back out from New Mexico once again and just smash everybody and, you know, pick up your check and leave, which to me, that's like, I'm not a smack talker. I let, you know, you, you let your, 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 your actions on the track or, you know, when I grew up wrestling, you let your actions on the mat take care of it. Those are the people that you fear. The ones that don't talk trash and want to just stare at you like they're staring through you. And as a racer, you'll see those people too. It's like when you go yeah. to a grudge race and you see the people, John, it's the dude that's not talking is the one that you don't want to race. Right. Because he's confident. In my opinion, most of the time, confidence is fairly quiet. And sometimes confident people are loud as well, but I feel like you don't have to be loud if you're confident in what you're doing, as far as talking smack, it's just not my thing. That's why I like heads up so much. You know, there's none of that really. I mean, of course, everyone talks about everybody else in their pits, but that's life. That's just everyone, everyone, what everyone's going to do anyways in anything, but there's none of that. There's no going up to each other in the lanes and being like, you know, if you don't give me a thousand bucks after this, I'm going to hit you over the head with my helmet at the end of the track. Like, no, there's, there's none of that. The, the most intense it gets is a burn down and that's pretty PG. And I have seen some burn downs get just in, interesting where I, I have seen starters that are just, you, you got two kinds of starters. The ones that are not amused by it, that are like frantically waving you in. And then I've literally seen a starter crack open a can of Coke and be like, you know, I can, I can sit here all day, boys. That's my favorite starter right there. That, that one, the one that go that tries to rile the crowd up when the cars won't go in. I love me a good staging duel, probably because my first round eliminations ever, I got in a staging duel for a minute and a half. <laughs> Personally, I've always found it interesting, at least in my bracket racing experience that 
the people I've had people try to double ball me play games and yeah, whatever. I'm going to do what, like, you're just, you're a placeholder holder and what's about to happen. I'm going to do my job and race my race and race the track. You can sit over there and do your taxes, turn cartwheels, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stage when I stage and do what I do. And what, what people that are trying to screw with others sometimes don't realize is that makes some drivers way better. Personally, like my, my lights are typically better or, or I just feel my focus get like really intense because you're trying to screw with me. So I'm now I'm like laser focused. And sometimes I, I think the game works because you get too focused and then know leave before the tree activates or like red light or like something because you're thinking about them instead of racing your race what i find entertaining is when people do try to play games with turbo cars and they don't maybe they haven't done their research or realize the person in the turbo car they're trying to burn down has spent an absorbent amount of money on their transmission so they can sit in the beams for the full amount of time and they're just going to sit there and wait and wait and wait Mm -hmm. and it's funny to see people that try to play that game and then they get burnt by it because they're so busy trying to play a game. They pull themselves out and they break concentration. Yep. Yeah. It's really interesting. I, I always just try to race my race and I don't, I try to not get any type of personal emotion or whatever you want to call it. I don't even like have beef with anyone, so to speak, but like, you know, there's racers that you race that are like, uh, like Joel Greathouse, like racing him. Like I was like, oh my God, like I, this dude's cool as hell. And I've wanted to race him forever, but you can't like let that get in your head when you're racing against the, the fastest people. It's like easy to go, oh my God, I'm racing so-and-so this round, but like, you can't do that. You always have to think I'm racing myself and it's my race to lose or win no matter who's in the other lane you you, it's funny it's it's like you almost have to act like you've always been there whether you're winning big or losing big it's it's the people that are just you know not emotionless but you see the teams that it's part of their job you know they just they there'll be a little bit of fire but otherwise it's like cool we won let's go back and you know do our turnaround you know they're not running down the track and there's no like screaming or yelling or whatever which yeah i mean I love me some screaming and yelling when someone wins around. That makes me happy. <laughs> My personal favorite is when you mostly see this with grudge and no time racing where the guys like take off running down the track. Yes. My boyfriend's brother does that to Jeff when he's running pro mod. Got, got to be careful because I've seen some people do some front side face plants getting in that glue and they just, <laughs> oh, that's funny. They, they just, you know, they, they go down or At least pro mod though. So it's not radial prep. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not as bad, but I, I've seen some people lose shoes and almost blow out ankles. You know, you got got to be careful. Got to know your terrain. Play stupid games. <laughs> and you know what? It's one of those. It's one of those things. Once again, as a media person, you you, you dream of that moment because you you yeah. can get a very meme worthy picture. You just yes, got to be all the clout. <laughs> yes, exactly. All the clout. Sometimes good clout. Sometimes not so good clout. Still clout. Yes. Speaking of clout, you know, drag racing. Bar none, in my opinion, is the most diverse motorsport out there, hands down. And I think the thing that really sets drag racing apart more than any other motorsport is the high level of female drivers. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in our current era, Erica Enders, for example, is yeah. a stone cold killer. Totally. Hands down. Shirley Muldowney, huge pioneer. Mm-hmm. Is that, are those people you looked up to, you know, what do you try to do to inspire those girls right now that are in junior dragsters to tell them, Hey, you can be here. Don't be afraid. Um, for me, honestly, it it has less to do with female. Um, just it didn't ever, it didn't, I didn't ever really realize the difference between the two until I started drag racing, you know, as a, as a woman, in general in life, you're kind of put under a microscope by society and that's society's fault, so to speak. That's no one's fault in drag racing. It's the same way. If you're a female driver, there's a microscope on you because there just is. Um, I never really thought of any thought of it that way though, is in regards to drag racing. 
like my people I've always looked up to in drag racing is like John Force. That's pretty much the main name that comes to mind. I'm like a John Force super fan. He's one of the only people I see at like when I go to PRI and I, I'm like, oh my God, there's John Force. Like I haven't seen him a million times. Kiefer makes fun of me. He's like, are you seriously so starstruck right now? I'm like, yeah, dude, that's John Force right there. Yeah. Yeah. So him for sure. Um, the, he was also a huge uh, hero, I guess, so to speak of my dad's just a legend, someone that will only ever exist once. I look up to his daughters. Obviously they they got a uh, opportunity to race because of their dad. I can relate to that on a very smaller scale, but uh, I just, I don't know. I try to inspire people in a way that feels natural to me because sometimes I have a hard time understanding how people inspire me until later, but it really ended up just them being themselves and being real and honest. So anytime a girl or a boy or a teenager or a grown person, whatever, wants to talk to me and ask me questions about my experience at the racetrack as a driver, like what it takes, like all of that, I can see the fire in some of their eyes. The certain ones that I'm like, that kid's gonna totally drive a race car, or at least I hope they get the opportunity to. That kid should be in a race car. And I just take extra time to explain, you know, you have to obviously have a lot of money somewhere to do this. You know, it's not easy. You have to have a solid team. You have to be willing to pour your whole soul into this. You have to stay humble. You have to, you know, maintain like your driver skill. Like you can't ever become complacent. Like you, I, I just try to explain to them like anything that I've like learned in the past few years or that I've learned from my dad, who's been such a mentor for me, um, you know, just obviously as my dad, my boss throughout most of my life, the drag racing team owner, the tuner. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So I just, I just try to explain what my version of the truth is to the younger generation. And I hope that resonates with them. I think your take on that is interesting. And here's the reason why you did not separate male from female you said anybody and the way that you paint that picture is a good picture because it shows that in drag racing the car doesn't know any different who's piloting it and right. to me i think that's definitely it's important for racers to remember to be inspiring to everybody it doesn't matter if you're a bracket racer if you're the local big gun bracket racer there might be some other guy's kid out there his dad will tell, oh, you know, so-and-so, they're the best here. Guess what? Yeah. They're going to look up to you, you know? And it's important, I think, for as racers to always acknowledge any fan. And with radio racing, it's getting to the point where it's been in small tire, outlaw racing, all the stuff that a lot of these racers now are getting fans. And it, yeah. it's, it's really cool to see. It is really, really cool to see from at least my perspective when I'm in someone's pit shooting pictures and yeah. you see fans walk up and this dude yeah. starts rattling stats off about this car <laughs> that the driver might not even know it, it's yeah. amazing it is amazing and I, as far as not like separating the two i think everyone's whole point in you know separating the two and pointing out like this one's a female drag racer is trying to like fix whatever inequality there's supposed to be or, or whatever just the difference there's more men racers and there are women racers but I think what actually extinguishes that is just by not differentiating the two at all that's always been my theory just calling everyone everyone and like I'm just a drag racer who happens to be female we have like a long ways till we get to that point but I think that in, in the end is what it will be is we're all just drag racers. You know, it was funny last year when I was out at the Vegas at the Super Street Car Nationals, it 
that race right there, for some reason, maybe I was just paying attention more. There was a lot more female racers there. And it was, it's so funny in drag racing that like, it, it's going to sound terrible when you say it like this, but <laughs> nobody cares because you're there to race. It's like, yeah. oh, she, she's here to race. You know, yeah, nobody cares. And it's awesome. That, 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 you know, it, it's funny that at the same time, it's not like that they are playing down to a female racer. It's because that you are their equal. You could go out and chop their head off on the starting line and steal the strike for them like a bank robber. And they have, you have to respect that. Yeah. Well, and the cool thing is too, with that, like, because like generally nobody cares, you can really tell like, and no specific thing comes to mind, just like in passing throughout life, things I recognize and notice you really can tell who does care (laughs) good or bad um you know somebody that thinks it's ridiculous that there's a female in a driver's seat someone that's that old school or that just you know you there are those people and it's in the little slick comments that you're like did you did you just really say that but they don't even realize what they said because it's just the, the the reality they grew up in and then there's the ones that are like oh my god you're a fu- you're a female a girl drag racer and you're just like yeah kid like, I, I don't know what to tell you but you can do it too and <laughs> and and hopefully you do because you seem to like it quite a bit switching know. switching gears a little bit is you know you guys will literally a pit you you are the epitome of get in where you fit in you will race at any event any series or whatever you know what are the kind of events that you like to go to with your car is it the one-off things is it you know the nmra stuff you know what what kind of events get you excited we've gone to so many events so many different kinds of events over the years that it's hard to pick really like what our our favorites would be or or and it is constantly always changing, you know, it just drag racing's ever evolving. So some years, some races are better than others. Some years, other races are better than those races were. And it's kind of just the way it goes, but, you know, we like to go where there's tight competition, um, where there's a lot of cars. We obviously safety's paramount. We're not going anywhere with guardrails. Um, people or places that have fans, you know, good media coverage, good announcing, like just places you feel appreciated and like celebrated as drag racers. Um, And just as as drag racers, meaning everyone, not just the drivers, the the crew, the everything, like just where drag racing in general is celebrated, where it feels like a big, huge party like a big, huge, serious party for days. And you feel like you were there for two weeks, but it was only four days and you're beat and you can barely wake up Sunday or Monday morning after the race ends. That's where we like to go. What's the, what, what's your favorite track? What, what's the one that you like, what, you, you see an event there, you're like, oh, you know, let, let's, let's go out of our way to go to that facility. I mean, lately for sure, Bradenton, that track's amazing. Um, Victor's really cool. The track prep there is amazing. I I mean, Bradenton's awesome. Um, I, I love MIR. Haven't gone there in a really long time, but I love MIR or MDIR and Bowling Green in the fall. That is, that's, that's a Bowling Green in general. Yeah. And when it's hot though, the track doesn't like us very much (laughs) yeah they're uh just for some reason it's like that bowling green around you know late august early september around ls fest time or you know someplace like outlarm again you know in oklahoma in august it sucks because it's hot and humid it's just rough yeah like i like heat to a certain point but when it's so hot 
and humid and nasty that like I pull my camera lens off and it instantly fogs up from coming out of the air conditioning, you know, it's yeah. rough. Yeah. Well, I wear glasses. So I walk outside and I can't see anything when I'm, I'm a desert girl. So wet heat and me don't really get along, but I live in Indiana now, so I better get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. You're definitely going to get introduced to the fun and excitement of it's 95 degrees and 95% humidity and it's not going to rain. Deal with it. Yeah. Well, you know, the Bowling Green, I'll definitely buy that for a dollar is one of my favorite tracks for the simple fact that I've been there for some, you know, NMRA finals. I've been there for LS Fest and I've been there for when the Street Outlaws were there. And there is something about that facility when it is a packed house that is just, it's magical. magical. It really, really is. It is. I love Bowling Green. I, I really like gateway to or whatever it's called now worldwide technology, technology. raceway yes. now my f- like the track that i love to go to anytime i have an excuse to go to is of course norwalk summit motorsports park because how you get treated there but that place i've went there for the night under fire which i highly recommend if you haven't like if you just want to go to an event just to drink beer and watch racing that's a show like that is an absolute show, but that place packed with 40,000 people is that that's nuts. Uh, yeah. I, I can only imagine that would like, be nuts. I, I've been there when there's been a lot of people there, but yeah, at the night under fire, I will never forget when they were doing the, uh, they were driving, all the drivers are going down the track in their funny cars. Like they're doing the slow parade. And I turned around to look at the crowd. I was going to get a crowd shot. And I'm like, this is the most people I've ever seen here. And you start looking around and there's people everywhere. I'm like, this is what it was like back in like the seventies and eighties when it was like crazy levels of like big events were all like that. I'm like, this is pretty cool. This would be cool to race in front of. Like um, ducks last races, you know, over COVID the crowds there, God, they were unreal for no mercy lights out. Those were awesome. It's those races are crazy as a drag racer because it's just hectic, but like, that's part of the fun. Like as long as you know how to survive it and you know how to go race one of those events, it's a, it's a blast. Like those, those are, those are great events. It's like going to the world cup. I I tell people that that's not an event. That's an experience. Like you're going to go to that That event. I have told people to go to world cup more times than I've told them to go to any other race just for the experience of like where I come from people that try to make their Hondas fast are like you know putting they're not on that level and and they go like 18 seconds to the quarter right that's what you that's what you think when you're just on the street and then you go to an event like that and you're like oh my god that's impressive I have a whole new respect for that yeah it it's i tell people you haven't lived until you've seen a toyota starlet where the wheel tubs are touching to the back it weighs two thousand pounds with the driver in it shifting gears going down the track on the bars not going straight and homeboy ain't lifted i'm like that's something you got to see those cars are nuts wild yeah and i'm the drivers are nuts. <laughs> yeah it and it's cool to be there too when you get like when you used to get the outlaw 10 five cars that would do quarter mile racing and you're standing at the top end and you yes. get to hear a blown alcohol door car make a full pull. Yeah. That's a different kind of top end noise. Man, I miss quarter mile. I really do. It you talked there, there's two kinds of drivers. Those are radial tire drivers, those that mm-hmm. are like hell yeah, I'll do quarter mile. And the guys that are like, I value my life and my gear. I'm not doing it. Well, I'm not going fast enough yet to be like, well, that's opinion because I am going fast enough for it to be ridiculous, but my personal comfort level, I'm fine with. It would be probably like six nineties or low sevens at like one ninety in the quarter that's what my dad did on 10 fives 
and there's kind of that if you could do it I can do it thing where what and also where he expects me to be able to do what he can do because I'm his daughter and I would love to do some quarter mile six second passes but would I do quarter mile pro mod absolutely not yeah different level of you know, you, you look at what the NHRA is doing right now where they, they smack pro charger in the mouth and kind of are trying to slow those cars down because it's, it's safety. Like, yeah, no, it's scary. I mean, there's so many cars get wadded up in quarter mile pro mod and it's like not the car's fault. Sometimes it's just, to, or the driver, it's the car's fault is what I meant. They do not want pro mods going 260 plus flat out just safety wise it's yeah. there, there's too much bad stuff that could happen well and like you know is it completely badass and if you're willing to put yourself in that position then like you are you have some huge balls but i don't my balls aren't that big i would <laughs> i would do top fuel before i got in a quarter mile pro mod yeah the, the pro mod's trying to do everything it can to make your life difficult going down the track it it yeah. really really is and then you get the guys like ken cartuccio and fiscus and kluger that have done 250 on radials which to me is like that, yeah nuts yeah that's like i've always told the joke the dudes at mickey thompson are like they just did what it's not no what you don't do that yeah <laughs> the tires aren't rated for that <laughs> it, it, well it's just the simple fact that you know a radio and a slick yeah like a slick is perfectly okay it'll dance you know, look at a pro mod you know big yeah. slick tire cars they move around mm -hmm. radials start moving around and they lose yeah. traction and bad stuff happens yeah you better know how to lift yeah, and even then you're you, you know go and with god on that steering one steering wheel and the shoot <laughs> it to me watch like I, i've done some in-car videos with pro mod racers mm -hmm. and they are earning their paycheck inside those cars just trying to keep it straight and what's crazier now is that you know you got a whole think about this at 250 plus miles an hour they're driving with one hand now because they have to mm -hmm. manually shift the car and find the parachute again yeah. different level of crazy it it totally is and you know i come from the the what is the word i'm looking for it's not tradition but i'll just use that word for time sake of you know you're always driving only with one hand my dad basically taught me that way so this is kind of a, a funny story um so i don't airship the car even though it's allowed because I like to have essentially three reaction times going down the track. I feel like it keeps me sharp and I, I just like it. I have nothing to do with this hand. So um, we had just put a new MoTeC in the car over the off season, the, the M150, I believe is what it's called. And uh, we have the help of Chris Groves at Dino Edge, known him for 20 plus years, really a family more than he is a partner, business partnership or whatever to us. Um, and he helps my dad out with some tuning stuff. Sometimes we always take our car to the dyno uh, and he's the one that owns the dyno. He's at uh, US Street Nationals helping us dial in the new MoTeC, which we went on board with NCS Designs, and he does like the MoTeC development software. So Chris would basically call in and say, you know, yo, we need this to do this. When this happens, based off this, blah, blah, you know how it goes. So then he writes the code, sends the firmware, downloads the computer, boom, we have that feature in the MoTeC. Super cool. But Chris uh, is very, he likes, he's a perfectionist. Like, perfectionist so he is pissed off that i don't have the air shifter hooked up since it's allowed he's like why would we not have the air shifter hooked up it's perfect every time like blah 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 blah, blah just going off about it and you know my dad's in the same mindset as me if she wants to shift the damn thing just let her shift it i shift it consistently so just set the shift points however consistently late or or early she is whatever 
and he just won't get over it. So my dad's like, all right, fine. Haley, put the air shifter on just for a couple rounds, whatever. If it doesn't work, we'll take it off. If it doesn't work out, we'll take it off. And I just like, I was like so mad about it. I was like, fine, I'll put the damn air shifter on. So I put it on, go and make a hit. I let go of the button. I smack the thing right as it moves. I touched it as it moved itself. And I told them, I got back to the pit. I was like, we can leave this thing in here if we want to. I was like, but I literally touched the shifter as it moved. So why can't I just hit the damn thing? And I was arguing, I wouldn't stop. I was so annoying about it. I just constantly, why don't we have the air shifter taken off? Why don't we have the air shifter taken off? And they finally took it, took it back off. But it was just a funny story of, um, you reminded me of driving with the one hand deal because I can't like I just this hand's like ole ole in the background like Ricky Bobby you just you don't know what to do with the one hand yeah yeah like I know what to do with this one but this one you know I I, I do it fidget spinner what do I do yeah yeah I gotta I gotta do something with it <laughs> if I was going faster I mean maybe I need both hands I don't know but as of right now it's a one hand game you know, it, it's all about being comfortable in the car, right? Yeah, it is. Well, Haley, our time here is coming to a close, and I like to give my uh, my guests their ability, if they want to channel their inner John Force, so you can reach back to your childhood, and you can remember when John would rattle off his sponsors and scare the hell out of Steve Evans. So you don't I have probably to probably be as good at it as him, but I do you, have some people I need to think. You don't have to actually do it, although people have done it, you know. No, that, I, I... I would like to definitely thank my long list of people and companies that deserve a shout out. So the Dino Edge, Chris, that's who, who I already was talking about. Um, Fourth Dimension Fab, that's Frank Barella's nephew. He did the turbo kit and a ton of other stuff on the car. Welding wise and fab work wise, Work Turbo, that's who our turbo company is. TBM Brakes, 1320 Junkie Performance, um, fastest plastic boss intake in the world. NCS Designs, that's the Motec developer, UPR products always, Weldon, love Jim, he's like one of my favorite people ever to see at a racetrack, uh, RGR, Rich Grow, helps us with uh, anything motor related, block related, heads related, whatever, Racing for Veterans, Mickey Thompson, uh, uh, Rudolph Motorsports, Riccardi Racing, Rick and Jenny are the best, they're always, always elbows deep in the car anytime anything goes wrong whether it's 10 p.m or three in the morning they have been there for most mostly all of that race part solutions and then yearwood performance back in albuquerque um but also my mom and my grandparents and all of my friends and yada yada i think i covered it <laughs> there you go Thank you, everyone that's what you got to do. And of course, I've got to thank our sponsors, AFR, the sponsor of today's podcast, Pro Charger Performance Distributors and Liquid Bali. That's a wrap on this one, Haley. Thanks so much for coming on. We'll thank try you. to get you on in the future. Maybe get Jeff, you know, we'll get, we'll get all y'all. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll have all kinds of fun, but look forward to see you at the track again real soon. Okay. Sounds good. Have a good night.